All right, go live. Should be working in a second. And it looks like we're live. All right, welcome everyone. We have uh, an exciting uh, topic uh, for, for today. We're going to talk about radiation uh, impacts on uh, our assets and space and uh, how to both understand and predict them. Not everyone uh, knows who works in uh, fundamental research in radiation belt physics that actually one of the biggest unresolved mysteries in radiation belts is how they impact various materials in space, which uh, makes it incredibly challenging uh, understanding their impacts on orbiting spacecraft. We have two great speakers uh, today. We will first uh, start with uh, Justin Licker. Justin Licker uh, is from APL, where he was just appointed as new principal professional staff. So congratulations, Justin. It's uh, for those who are not from APL, that actually is a pretty big deal here. Uh, Justin works in uh, Space Environment Effects Engineering Group, uh, where he's chief technologist and he's uh, leading one of uh, the sections in the group. Uh, he has multiple roles. He supports many uh, national security space projects, but he also works in the IMAP, uh, that is uh, the mission we're building currently at APL, where he works as radiation hardness assurance um, uh, on radiation hardness assurance uh, activities. Um, he also uh, teaches classes in the Whitening School of Engineers. And before he joined uh, APL, he has an extensive background in industry. He worked for Lockheed Martin Systems and uh, Goodrich prior to joining uh, us in uh, 2018. And his newest research interest is now in pulsed laser single e event effects, which uh, I don't even know exactly what it means. He'll have to tell me some other day. Uh, and uh, then after Justin, we have, uh, uh, we're very grateful that Yanis Douglas is joining us all the way from Greece, where it's getting uh, late on a Friday night. Uh, Yanis is a professor and the head of uh, space physics group in National University of Athens, as well as the president of uh, a very new uh, uh, Hellenic Space uh, Center, uh, which is a new agency in uh, Greece. Uh, his scientific experience um, is mainly in solar terrestrial coupling and related to multiple magnetospheric processes that Yanis published many, many papers uh, on. Uh, Yanis is a full member of National uh, uh, of International Academy of Astronautics since uh, 2011, National Correspondence of Greece for Yaga since 2013, and the Editor-in-Chief uh, in, in Analysis Geophysique. Uh, he also has multiple other roles that I will simply run out of time if I start mentioning them all. So uh, we're very grateful to have him uh, joining us. So we'll run it as usual. We'll first uh, give the floor to Justin, and then immediately after that, we will uh, transition to Yanis, and we will hold all the questions and uh, uh, discussions uh, for the end of the seminar. Uh, Justin, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Very good. <clears throat> Can I get confirmation that sharing, sharing is okay? Absolutely, looks good. All right, well, th thanks very much for the, the opportunity to speak today. Appreciate the, 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 the kind introductions. Um, if, I will just jump right in. We don't have a whole lot of time here. So uh, we'll be discussing the effects, basically, natural space environmental effects on, on design operations of spacecraft. So um, obviously there are many uh, environmental hazards, uh, effects, threats that the uh, flight systems experience when, when operating in the in the space radiation environment um, and given given the time allocation today I, I think really it's it's best to try and simplify things as best we can uh, for this audience so um, generally speaking uh, it, it's it's possible to kind of break things down I think into maybe three or four different discrete discrete uh, effects so so highlighted in green or what I, I'll, I'll refer to as cumulative dose effects. So these are the things with fairly long characteristic time scales um, that, that often lead to 
um, long-term type de degradation in performances. In, in pink, uh, it's a unique effect known as single event effects, which are pretty much as they uh, as, as described, but they're instantaneous uh, effect resulting from the passage of a single particle through, through something sensitive. Um, spacecraft charging in itself will we'll break that down um, into, into two, two variants thereof, but generally speaking here, we're talking about um, <clears throat> impacts from, from free plasma, you know, plasma related effects. All of these things, and and then some, such as contamination and outgassing, um, et cetera, can combine and 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 impact each other in a um, you know sort of um, uh, combined effects sort of way. And I'm going to kind of leave that leave that out of this discussion because I think that that in itself could be a, a talk. And I also should note that that for the conversations today, I'm ignoring anything any hostile threats, so any any sort of nuclear weapons type. Type effects. I don't. I don't need to um, stress this. I think for this audience, except as kind of a general reminder. You know, so so missions operating in the near Earth environment in the magnetosphere um, will have hazards. Um, will have driving hazards that differ from orbit to orbit. Um, so a mission operating in a mid latitude LEO regime will have a different sort of driving hazards than a mission operating, say, in a, at a navigation type orbit. And this chart, um, I use it frequently in, in, in talks like this, is really meant to reflect this in a very general sense, in a qualitative sense, what are likely to be the driving uh, environmental hazards and how do those driving environmental hazards kind of bubble up into the uh, descriptive engineering hazards that, that I've covered at the top. Um, point of this chart also is to kind of highlight the differences in characteristic time scales as well. So uh, for this audience, just useful to keep in mind as we start talking about these effects. So really the, the brunt of the, the conversation today is really to dig into the engineering effects here. So first up is, is that which I've in, entitled the cumulative dose effects. Under this umbrella, really we're talking about terms that you, you may have heard, total ionizing dose or TID. And in that, we're referring to dose that's absorbed in a target material resulting from energy deposition of the, of the um, particle radiation. So ambient particles passing through a target material, they're losing energy uh, and in so depositing dose. For EEE or quadi devices, right, electronics, um, typically this manifests itself in long-term parametric degradation in the device. It may or may not ultimately fail, um, but in the in the time before the part fails, um, <clears throat> the user, the end application, will be suffering from slowly degrading performance. So when one is selecting that part, you're looking at the data sheet, you're picking that particular part for one reason or another. You know, you like its performance in gain, for example. Um, effects such as TID and also uh, non-ionizing dose will ultimately, over time, as dose is accumulated, lead to degradation in those parameters. It will potentially go out of spec, fail to meet requirements, uh, at which point in time it may or may not start to influence the, the actual circuit or function in which it's being used. Um, displacement, damage, displacement damage dose or total non-ionizing dose is a, kind of a second subcategory of a cumulative dose effect. The difference there is that the um, it's it's not an ionizing effect, but rather the the physical uh, atoms in the crystal lattice are being displaced as a as a function or as a result of particles passing through the material. Um, the upshot in terms of uh, impact on part and circuit or function is is the same as non -ionize, or as ionizing dose. Uh, subcategory also that, that folks may have heard in their day-to-day -day lives is the effect of elders or enhanced low dose rate sensitivity, which is a very real effect in which the degradation in a particular parameter is actually more severe when the, um, the device, in this case bipolar devices, are exposed at dose rates that are more representative to those that we see in space. Oftentimes, so, uh, very frequently, ground testing is performed at accelerated dose rates relative to the dose rates in space. In reality, certain classes of devices actually see more 
more severe degradation at lower dose rates than they do higher dose rates. Um, in terms of verification, um, primarily we, we rely on climatological models as these are long, long characteristic time scales involved. Um, frequently mission integrated trap, trap particles, fluences specifically are used in generating um, things like dose depth, dose depth curves, which are used very frequently in the analysis. I'm, I'm highlighting here in the lower right um, a, a T and ID effect, so the, the Halloween storm impacting the performance of a geosolar array. As a, as a point of comparison, remembering that notional chart I shared earlier, um, I'm not going to talk to this in great detail, but just as a point of comparison, some some reference type missions um, for uh, you know mid 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 latitude LEO mission. Um, uh, lower MEO, so about uh, eight or ten thousand kilometer mission geo and a, a tundra orbit. So I've I've highlighted some dose depth curves. Really meant to illustrate two things: <laughs> the um, relative contributions of the trapped protons versus trapped electrons at these different different orbits, uh, and you and you can kind of probably guess where um, where things uh, are dominated by protons, for example, versus electrons. But also a couple of um, kind of checkpoints. So predicted ionizing dose per year at fairly uh, fairly frequently used um, effective shielding values of 100 mil, uh, 100, 100 thousandths of an inch, 100 mil equivalent aluminum and 300 mil equivalent aluminum. Uh, just as a point of reference, so one can see uh, the relative comparisons between these fairly common orbits. So in terms of... Um, Trends. So, radiation harness assurance typically breaks down uh, in terms of do, do you know what the environment is? So, the, the ambient environment, derived dose environments, um, a lot of time is often spent predicting doses at specific locations. So, 3D modeling is used. We kind of have, have that pretty well in hand right now. That's, that's relatively quick, quick, to, quick to do. Um, Biggest challenges I'm highlighting at the, at the bottom is the, the trends towards using non-rad hard devices, so alternate grade devices. Um, it makes things a bit more tricky because you start to see more lot to lot, device to device variability. Typically it means more testing. Um, similarly, the trend towards more uh, um, you know, fuzzy systems, uh, lower class missions are buying a lot of stuff off the shelf. Oftentimes, those of us in the in the rad effects community don't have a lot of insights into what's in there, so it makes things uh, a bit tricky. It, at the end of the day, it also kind of means that a couple of KRADs start to matter. Uh, many of us uh, grew up in the generations where uh, the difference between 85 KRAD and 100 KRAD was kind of in the noise. Now, with uh, stuff getting softer, the difference in two and a half and four KRAD ten, tends to matter a lot more than it used to, both in the ability to predict it and the influence on, on operations. Next, next topic, single event phenomena. As I mentioned earlier, it, it is the impact caused by a single particle passing through the sensitive node in a device. Um, there are, this is restricted to triple E quality type devices, a laundry list of effects um, that can be completely catastrophic or destructive, meaning one particle, one hit, device ceases to function um, forever, or um, non destructive in the sense that the targeted device does not itself fail and may be hit over and over again, um, but yet it, it, it suffers effects that can impact the operation of the function in which it's operating. So a couple of the examples here I'm highlighting are um, um, frequency variations in a PWM, uh, single bit errors, multi-bit errors in memory, and here's a destructive failure in a, um, in a linear device. Um, this is again has to do with uh, the device losing energy as it passes through the the sensitive node of a de of the the uh, triple E part. It gets more and more complicated as you start to consider instead of say uh, comparators or operational amplifiers, but things that are more complex, mixed mode, heterogeneous, things like FPGAs and SOCs, for example, exhibit potentially dozens of different single event effect vulnerabilities depending on the area of the die that gets hit and kind of the underlying connections between different locations of that die. 
So as, as technology trends have scaled, so, set, so node sizes have decreased, kind of unlike cumulative dose effects, as node sizes decrease, here things tend to get worse. Um, the reason for that is, is meant to be illustrated here on the left is ionization tracks now start to um, themselves be as large or larger than the, the technology nodes meaning one ion is now affecting more and more nodes. So what we start to see now, and this is even a dated, uh, a, a, a dated chart, but um, for example, in, in memories or complex devices, we see more multi-cell errors or multi-bit errors relative to single bit errors. This, again, I mentioned is dated from a Vertex 5, uh, you start to see three, four, five-bit errors start to dominate at fairly high LETs. For more and more complex devices, this, this trend is moving to the left, um, and it makes things much more challenging from a design and test standpoint. You also see the onset LET, or linear energy transfer, um, starting to fall towards one, and in, in, in many cases, well below one, fractions of, uh, of one. Um, Along with this, you start to see more complicated and, and, and Cephes or functional interrupts being the dominant failure mode in these devices. Wanted to get to the kind of current and future trends here. In, in a general sense, rate prediction is a product of the transported environment and the device sensitivity. So as, um, as things get more and more complex, um, that gets trickier from a testing standpoint and fully identifying the device sensitivity. Um, many of these devices require very application specific testing, which kind of leads towards the trends from prior generations, legacy approaches, testing from the technology node up to full up system reliability assessment. Now on lower class missions in particular, we rarely, well, we flip it first of all, and we rarely get below assessing at the system or functional level. The focus there has to be on understanding critical functions. Yeah. I've been the interest of time, wanna jump ahead. Um, so general sense, spacecraft charging describes the accumulation of charge on satellite surfaces and within materials. It is possible to break this down into surface charging and internal charging and that's, I think most easily described as being broken down uh, as to which surfaces, locations, et cetera, have ac direct access to the ambient plasmas. So to me, I like to think of it as the locations where uh, photo emission can happen, secondary emission can happen, and backscatter can happen fall into the category of surface charging. Effectively then everything else is, is transitions over into deep charging or internal charging. So those are typically volumes within the spacecraft structure, but also volumes even in surface materials or films that are not affected directly by UV or backscatter or um, secondary electrons. In terms of risk and mitigation, uh, when it comes to surface charging, I, I, I think there's two there's two camps. You either um, prevent the occurrence of all discharges, um, which is easy to say, difficult to do, or you demonstrate that your system can handle the discharges, which also which is also easy to say and difficult to do. In that in that sense, you have to have a high level of confidence that you know the types, the frequency, the amplitudes of the discharges in order to demonstrate that you're safe. Um, surface charging, I think, is easily described from a current balance. So your incoming, uh, incoming currents, such as that from your electrons, your protons or ions, and your outgoing currents, your photo currents, your um, backscatter, your yields, um, <clears throat> They balance the the target or the, the surface will assume a voltage resulting from that current balance. Um, very quick characteristic time scales. Um, you're seeing some uh, EFW measured um, frame charging on valon probes here on the upper left. You're seeing some 
large eclipse charging uh, on a, a Los Alamos vehicle at Geo here. Um, in terms of risk, it, it, mostly the risk is focused on electrostatic discharges. Um, also, the influence to um, science operations um, resulting from frame charging few volts to kilovolts potentially at geo in, in eclipse uh, and how that impacts the ability to detect the particles you're looking for. Uh, of course, ESD, electrostatic discharges, can really make um, things things uh, go bad uh, on areas like solar rays where there are there's stored charge and there's the possibility of um, introducing system generated energy to feed these electrostatic discharges. They also um, generate radiated emissions emissions themselves, right? And, and can have the potential to uh, impact the operation of RF systems, for example, radars and, and, and things like that. I will note um, for this crowd, so team at AFRL, um, has published observations where they uh, they reportedly have detected uh, have ground based detections of electrostatic discharges occurring on the Valen probe solar arrays. So <clears throat> internal charging, as the name uh, describes, in this case, particles penetrate through a spacecraft body uh, and and store and become stored in insulators, uh, electrically insulating materials or um, on metal surfaces that are not well grounded, so high, high impedance to ground. Very frequently when talking about internal charging, the focus goes towards cables and wires, right? Insulations, jackets, uh, connectors, which include insulation between contacts, uh, circuit boards, um, conformal coating, things of that nature. To a lesser extent, but not to be excluded, are, are optical elements. So uh, glasses, lenses, um, you know, e e even um, fiber optics. So in this instance, um, it's dominated by higher energy electrons, right? So on the low end, uh, tens, tens of keV is enough to get beneath blankets and, and be problematic. On the high end, we're talking about Frequently, MEV uh, type electrons are required to, to frequently charge boards and things that are pretty well shielded. Um, in these instances, the discharges, I'm sorry, charge accumulation, so field development can happen over many, many, many months. So this is really driven by material properties itself. Over that time, a fairly significant field can be developed such that when uh, ESD happens, the discharges can be quite large. So tens of amperes, for example. Um, and because of the locations of these materials, there is a uh, very close proximity to sensitive electronics. So, so uh, internal charging can result in catastrophic failures or um, annoy uh, annoying uh, anomalies relating to uh, electronics. In terms of uh, trends and trends and and, and uh, future looking statements, again, uh, 3D Monte Carlo based tools are pretty readily available. Um, benchmarking and uh, validation um, varies from tool to tool, uh, but it's it's certainly an area of interest. Um, particularly tricky is the uh, the prevalence of non-homogeneous materials again so things like you know lunar regolith for example um and but also engineered coatings and films that have you know several materials in it uh measuring the material properties that are needed for assessments inclusion in analyses um is particularly tricky uh, and I'll I'll kind of not just read this verbatim, but, but kind of highlight the bottom here. And my opinion, complacency is a real thing. So um, those of us that, that you know, were, were working a generation ago um, will recall uh, the pretty typical, uh, the pretty tricky, challenging times when it came to spacecraft charging uh, more than more than a decade ago. That really hasn't happened in recent years. So there's a there's a lot of temptations to um, undervalue the risks associated with internal charging in general, but also spacecraft charging in, in orbits that aren't geo. And in the interest of wrapping up here, I kind of wanted to, to get off the stage with this. Uh, for this community, I, I guess I have some asks. 
um, Van Allen probes in particular is a, is a really amazing set of data, of course, from a, a science standpoint, but also in the sense of um, engineering validation and verification of some of the, the, the hardness assurance and spacecraft charging tools that we're trying to use today. Uh, we would very much benefit from um, operational data if people have it and are willing to share it. For example, um, single event effect rates that you might for devices that were operating in, in, in any of your instruments or flight systems would very much enable us to, to make a positive headway in terms of validating um, our AI or model-based methods for hardness assurance. We'd, we'd love to talk to you. Um, also like to ask, you know, keep, keep, keep insisting on housekeeping sensors. Yeah, the exquisite science is great, but in terms of engineering hazards and anomaly attribution, you know, we, we, we like the housekeeping sensors just as much. And, uh, and lastly, uh, meetings like this keep keep conversations going and keep inviting uh, scientists and engineers to the same meeting so that we can talk. And with that, I th thank you for the time. And we'll get thank off the stage. Thank you very much, Justin, and a very comprehensive, excellent overview of different impacts. Uh, as, as I mentioned, we're holding all the questions until the end. Meanwhile, of course, chat is active. Feel free to uh, put some of them there or answers or discussion there. And with that, from discussion of the impacts, we're going to Yanis, who is going to talk about some progress on predicting uh, space weather. So yours, Yanis. Thank you. Let's put up uh, PowerPoint. There it is, I think. All right, we can okay. see your PowerPoint. Okay. And it's in presentation mode, excellent. Is it okay now? Yes. Okay, okay, thank you. So <clears throat> just let me... Fine. So I'm going to talk about uh, the Safe Space project today. Uh, which uh, this is the landing page for anybody interested with a QR code. And um, this was a three year uh, collaborative research project that received funding from the European Union under the activity secure and space and safe space environment. So this means that the, well, this, the service that was designed by Safe Space pertains to the safety of space assets from the natural hazards of space weather. And uh, Justin's talk was a great introduction to this because uh, he presented uh, all the all kinds of uh, natural hazards that uh, spacecraft face out there. And um, yeah. so safe space is uh, about making space a safer place. Um, however, the scientific basis of this service that includes spacecraft measurements, model simulations, algorithms for the uh, as much as possible comprehensive understanding, uh, now casting and forecasting of all the processes that lead to the production of uh, highly energetic electrons of electrons in geospace. Um, so this may well be used for future efforts regarding security from human-driven intentional hazards. Uh, so you can understand that the European Union would want it to cover both safety and security aspects. So we focus on safety, but uh, this work could well be used also for security in future. So making space a safer and also more secure place then. And let me just uh, remind everybody that uh, the risk is actually the product of hazard and vulnerability, meaning that if there is any way uh, to drastically reduce vulnerability, we would not care very much about the hazards, would we? I mean, okay, we would in terms of the physics involved and trying to understand, but in practical terms, if we could uh, minimize the vulnerability, 
it would be great, but we cannot do that because uh, it, this is only conditionally feasible in space. We cannot really uh, reduce vulnerability to make it uh, negligible because this would mean, this would simply mean a lot of uh, shielding, which is not affordable in space. So the other way to minimize the risk is to somehow, well, we cannot really um, extinguish the hazard, but what we can do is uh, to, in the, to uh, try to achieve a timely and accurate forecast of the hazard, uh, which could in future enable protective measures. And this is uh, what uh, Safe Space is about. Safe Space uh, was meant to deliver a prototype forecast service of particle radiation indicators for the outer Van Allen belt. So it's, we address electrons, relativistic electrons, and therefore we address among all other hazards that Justin talked about in his uh, presentation, we address specifically the internal charging hazard, which is due to uh, highly energetic electrons. And we also had the uh, ambition to enable forecast capabilities with lead times of four, of two to four days, which we do not currently have. And this is just a diagram showing all the hazards that uh, Justin talked about, uh, surface charging, internal charging, single event effects, total dose. Uh, we, had, we had a great presentation and we, uh, concentrate, we, we address internal charging through electron radiation storms. And uh, we know from, uh, from re records of uh, previous satellites, this is a great graph showing um, data from PRESS and SAMPEX. We know that internal charging uh, is associated with the electron belt and uh, we usually have problems where, whenever and wherever penetrating electron fluxes are high. So the concept, the basic concept was that we would construct a pipeline of physical codes that propagates information and uncertainties from the sun to the earth. And this is the, uh, the logical diagram. We have solar wind properties that are propagated uh, by appropriate codes uh, to L1. From L1, we map the conditions, the solar wind conditions into the magnetosphere uh, and uh, estimate the, the expected uh, geomagnetic activity level, practically speaking, the KT index. And then we also have an internal uh, magnetosphere part. I will talk about it, uh, which is uh, of course driven by solar wind parameters. And uh, this internal part is used then to produce an electron flux map. And through the electron flux map, we provide the particle radiation indicators. So the, the work packages of the project reflect this uh, concept. We, have, uh, we had a work package that was devoted to the solar and, the, and interplanetary drivers. We, another one that was devoted to the inner magnetosphere dynamics. And from these two, we derive the space safety service, which was of course also evaluated and verified. So starting from the sun, what we have is uh, uh, we, we uh, start with solar magnetograms, uh, which use uh, different observatories as input. Uh, we use solar magnetograms they provide maps and time series of the solar wind at about 0 0.1 uh, AU uh, through the use of uh, the multi-VP solar wind model. And we take then those conditions and we propagate them to the earth through uh, both euphoria, uh, which is the uh, model uh, of, um, uh, of our Belgian colleagues uh, led by Stefan Putz for CMEs, and the Helio uh, 1D, which is a one-dimensional MHD code for uh, high-speed solar st streams or CIRs. So we use two different codes to propagate solar wind conditions from 0.1 AU to L1. 
And then we use uh, artificial uh, neural networks, ANN methods to uh, map the solar wind conditions from L1 uh, into the magnetosphere. So we predict, practically speaking, we predict the KP level inside the in the magnetosphere. And we also use those propagated solar wind parameters to estimate the ULF waves through the Emerald model. So uh, the propagated solar wind parameters are used twofold, one for the KP level and two for the ULF waves. And then we also need, in the inner magnetosphere, we also need the plasma density. So this was done by uh, another Belgian uh, institution, uh, the BIRA uh, Institute. They have been uh, working on uh, the plasma density uh, map parameterization. So they have uh, constructed, they have provided uh, a 3D dynamic model of uh, the plasma density uh, that was improved. I mean, th this this um, was perfected. It was, a, it was an evolution of a previous model they had. It was improved through incorporating satellite data from cluster and Van Allen probes. And uh, it is parameterized uh, with respect to local time and to and geomagnetic activity level, meaning that the forecasted KP level also leads to a forecast of the plasma density. Then we also have a VLF mo a wave model that um, was um, that used data a database that we constructed during uh, an older European Union project, the Marble project, uh, we get the VLF uh, wave uh, power, and we also have the ULF uh, wave uh, uh, diffusion coefficients, the VLF diffusion coefficients that are predicted, uh, as I said, through the propagated uh, solar wind parameters. So this is the internal magnetosphere part, and this part is then fed into the Salambo uh, ensemble Kalman filter model, which is a data assimilation radiation belt model that provides a global forecast of the particle fluxes along uh, across the radiation belts and for specific um, selected uh, orbits, uh, which uh, I will show uh, uh, when I will actually very soon when I will show you the uh, the service. So the ensemble uh, Kalman filter is an ensemble adaptation of the classical Kalman filter, which computes an estimation of the state of the system given uh, a model and observations. So the, the observations that we use, let me continue to go to the work package four, which is, which is the service. Uh, so we predict a time dependent state of the outer radiation belt electrons through Salambo. And uh, the, for the assimilation, we use uh, ghost data uh, for uh, geo, for the geo orbit, and uh, Galileo, oops, sorry, let's go back. And for, uh, for the navigation orbit, we use uh, data from the Galileo navigation satellites of the European Union. And this, uh, and this leads us to the indicators. These indicators, uh, which I will show very soon, they were defined in collaboration with space industry. Uh, and uh, they were also evaluated by, uh, operate by, by users. So this is the, um, uh, the flow of the pipeline. We start with the heliospheric propagation. As I mentioned, we use Euphoria and Helio 1D to propagate solar wind parameters to L1. Uh, through uh, neural networks, we uh, provide a forecast of the KP index. And this is then used both for the VLF wave prediction and the plasma density prediction. They are, uh, they are combined at the far west code, which is a wave particle interaction code. Uh, and together with the radial diffusion coefficients that are also predicted through the propagated solar wind, they are fed into Salambo and Salambo provides then the electron phase space density. Uh, for the, as I said, for the assimilation, we use in situ observations. Uh, 
only for Geo and uh, Mio, uh, as you can understand. Uh, the, therefore, our Leo predictions are weaker than the Geo and Mio predictions. Okay, um, this is another view of the pipeline. Um, the solar wind ensemble forecast, uh, the KP ensemble forecast, they are fed into the core of the uh, prediction code of the prediction prototype, and uh, we get the electron phase space density. So uh, this is the landing page of the service. And uh, I think that if I will click here, it should open. Let me see if it will work. Oops, no, not Safari. Uh, I I want to show you the service, but to do this, I think I have to stop sharing PowerPoint and uh, start sharing uh, the Firefox window, which is uh, here. Okay. So what we see now is the the page of the service. So the last synchronization, you can see here, last synchronization of data was today, actually, uh, May 26. And we can see the predictions for uh, Leo, Mio, and uh, Geo. Uh, but uh, no, that was too early. Sorry, I have to switch back again <laughs> because I have to show you the concept of these indicators. Sorry, sorry for this. I go back to my PowerPoint presentation <clears throat> very quickly. Okay, is it, uh, do we see again the PowerPoint presentation or not yet? No, we see PowerPoint. PowerPoint, right? Okay, fine. So let's go. Okay, uh, our indicators are based on historical uh, uh, data sets. Uh, for the three main orbits. So geo, navigation, uh, MEO orbit, and uh, low Earth orbit. So for the geo orbit, uh, we have been uh, using historical GOES electron data, which you see here. So it's a data set covering more than 20 years. And uh, based on this data set, we have uh, a cumulative distribution function, which you can see here. So this is simply speaking, the percentage of days uh, during which the daily flux is uh, exceeded. And uh, we have set the threshold uh, values of 2% for very extreme events and 20% for moderate events. But these thresholds for our indicators uh, are, uh, can be customized, can be set by uh, registered users. So, uh, let me also go through the, this is the navigation orbit data set uh, coming from GPS. And now we also add Galileo data from the European um, navigation satellites. This is also quite a long data set and uh, the corresponding CDF here. And we also have, of course, the same for the low earth orbit where the data set is even longer. It's something like 40 years. But unfortunately we don't have uh, contrary to GEO and MEO, we don't have any real-time data to use for the assimilation. So uh, this is a, just an example of uh, validation uh, for uh, the St. Patrick's 2015 storm for the three uh, orbits, uh, the geostationary orbit, the GNSS orbit, and the low Earth orbit. So we can, it's clear, clear that uh, the prediction, which is the, the, the now cast is the, the red or orange and the forecast is the green. So it's, it's much better for the uh, geostationary orbit and the MEO orbit than for the low Earth orbit uh, for the reasons I already mentioned. And uh, now is the time actually for the, um, for the, the service and let me go again to the service. How much time do I, do I have? Sorry, uh, Sasha. You have a few minutes. Okay, so let's again, let's go back to the service again. Let me show you how the service looks like. 
and it's uh, Firefox is here, okay. So as I said, these are the values uh, that were estimated today. Uh, and uh, for each orbit, for each of the three orbits, we have uh, an indicator for yesterday, today, and the following three days. Uh, this is the 20% threshold, uh, which is the moderate events. And this is the 2% threshold for the extreme events. So uh, yes, we see that yesterday for GEO, we had uh, quite an elevated flux of uh, high energy electrons, higher than 400 kV. And uh, what we can do here is to change, uh, as you can see here that we can set the threshold. So I could go and um, put the extreme event threshold for, at, for example, 10%. And for the moderate events, I can do it at 50%, let's say. And if I set this uh, threshold, uh, we see that the flag or the color uh, changes. So it, if uh, an operator would consider uh, a 10%, the 10% uh, of historical events as extreme, we would, have, we would have an alert for May the 28th, which is in two days. So this is the concept and we can also view the cumulative distribution function for all orbits. Uh, okay, and this is the case here for the low Earth orbit. We, we can see that with respect to the historical values, we are actually quite safe for the next days. Uh, what we see here, they are quite close. Uh, this is for uh, yesterday, this is for today, this is for tomorrow. And the star is the median value, while the green and the red uh, bullets here are the uh, 25th, 75th, and 5th and 95th percentile, quant uh, sorry, quantile uh, points, actually. Uh, and we can see the predicted points for each day by clicking here. So because we put the extreme threshold lower, they are now for uh, May 28th uh, in red, actually. So this is an alert, but this is only because we changed the threshold. So let's go back and the same, uh, we have the same for MIO and GEO, let's see GEO, the cumulative distribution function for GEO. Uh, yesterday, as I said, yesterday was quite elevated, today, tomorrow, etc. So. This is how the service looks like. So I will stop this and go back to my PowerPoint presentation, which is uh, here, okay. And uh, let me go on. So this is uh, the concept. As I mentioned, this, this is yesterday, this is today, and this is the prediction. We have a prediction for the next three to four days. So what we had today was only for the next three days, but we can do up to four days. I already showed this uh, live. We also predict, we uh, also provide the prediction of the KP index and uh, during the evaluation phase, uh, users ask us to also provide historical uh, short term, I mean, <clears throat> the uh, last two weeks of historical data. So this is just an example. It's uh, two weeks before. Uh, I will not go back to the service, but we also provide uh, the situation for the past two weeks, which uh, we were told is very useful information for hind casting. So whenever an operator, uh, whenever operators have a serious problem, what would they would like to, uh, to see easily is the, situa the situation over the past two days. So this is available, this is currently available uh, for GEO through GOES data. Uh, for the time being, it is not available. Well, it has not been available for me for some time because of the unavailability of near real-time GPS data 
and near real time, well, for GPS, we know that they are not publicly available. We had Galileo data available, but uh, we had some slight problems with uh, also with the Galileo satellites. So let me summarize uh, the safe space um, prototype service uh, produces indicators that correspond that address internal charging, which uh, we know is induced by electrons, energetic electrons higher than with energies higher than uh, approximately 400 keV. And uh, as Justin said, this is this problem uh, builds up over uh, several days or even longer. So it is not an acute problem, which means that. Uh, forecasting can be helpful in um, mitigating uh, the, this hazard. Uh, the, these environmental indicators have been are prepared on the basis of long-term in situ data. So we provide the information of how serious the situation over the next few days will be compared to historical data. So this is the concept. We, are, we uh, inc have included three orbits of interest, GEO, GNSS, MEO, and LEO. Uh, we have a complementary, oops, sorry. We have a complementary uh, forecasting of the KP index. Users can define their, th their own thresholds for low, moderate, and, inter and intense activity. And we also provide historical in-situ data for the past two weeks, currently for GEO only. Uh, there is a rich uh, uh, bibliography. We have uh, published 17 peer-reviewed papers that uh, describe all aspects of uh, safe space. Uh, we have over 100 conference presentations, and we uh, also organized three dedicated splinter sessions and town hall meetings and various conferences. So in the landing page of the project, uh, we also have all links uh, links for all uh, peer-reviewed papers. Uh, if not all of them, uh, for sure, the, the um, most of them are open access because we have this obligation to our funding agency, which is the European Commission. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, thank you for the overview, quite an extensive uh, project and uh, uh, infrastructure that you built. Uh, the floor is open for questions, discussions to both of our speakers. Please raise your hand or put it in chat. Let me uh, then first ask question to Justin. Justin, I have a very naive question. You know, you described uh, several effects and details. They all seem to have their own sets of complexities associated with them. But is it possible to say that like one of them is more challenging than the other, uh, the others uh, relative to assessment of the end impact on, uh, uh, on our satellite? I, th I think not nowadays the tricky one is the single event effects. I, I, I think with um, with the trends that we're seeing in, in desiring to to buy sort of uh, off the shelf systems, boards, boxes, and, and and put it together, and in many cases the lack of insights into what's actually in there and how things are hooked together. I, I think single event effects in my opinion, is, is the tricky one these days. Uh, does it make uh, one orbit more challenging than uh, than the other again, among, you know, many popular orbits that we currently use for commercial o space? O o only, only in the sense that the softest of parts will be sensitive to proton-induced single event effects. Um, so things that are operating in the inner belt or that see the SAA frequently uh, become challenging. And and things that are operating towards the edge of the magnetosphere or in space that are that get hit with uh, with with nasty uh, solar particle events or something um, might m m might fail almost catastrophically or to the point where they they will cease to function in a way that may as well be catastrophically. Those are certainly difficult to assess uh, based on modeling as well. Thank you, Justin. 
And uh, Yanis, I have a question. Just uh, you described already very comprehensive infrastructure that has been built over the years. What are the next steps for you? Well, uh, the, the next steps, uh, the very next step is to try to make this um, to to make this service pre-operational, uh, because. Um, what we have uh, what we have designed and produced is just a prototype and uh, i have to say i'm very happy that it was working today <laughs> to be absolutely honest because <laughs> it is not uh, i mean it's really a prototype and uh, uh, there is no guarantee at all that uh, it uh, works every day i i have to be honest right and because we didn't we did not have this obligation towards the european union but but today, miraculously, it worked <laughs> so very well. But uh, our ambition is, of course, to uh, uh, to try to, I mean, on the long run, to make this sometime at some point operational. Uh, and we are now running. Uh, we are implementing an, uh, a European Space Agency project that uh, will uh, lead to a pre-operational version of this service. Uh, of course, we still have uh, the, the weaknesses with regard to uh, the physical models. And uh, I would say that the most uh, serious weakness and the largest uh, uncertainties that the, mod that the whole pipeline has relate to the propagation of the solar wind parameters from point one AU to L1. I think we all know that, <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, our colleagues, uh, our French colleagues who uh, are responsible for the 1D MHD code and our Belgian colleagues who are responsible for Euphoria, I know that they are con they continue to work on these codes. So this is something that uh, goes on, you know, in parallel. Um, and of course, I mean, everybody is working on every aspect, but I mentioned the two main things. Uh, you know, the evolution to a pre-operational version and uh, how we can make our predictions even better. Uh, thanks, Yanis. You should have said, and it always works. You know, it works now, <laughs> so it works every day. <laughs> Lynn. Uh, yeah, so the, on, the, on the topic of being inside or outside the main atmosphere, the, I would naively assume that the radiation belts are harder on spacecraft than SAP events, but are solar SEP events worse for spacecraft for S like single event upsets or? Well, it depends. Or, like just imagine you have like a, a spacecraft that's not designed for the radiation belts. It passes through the radiation belts. This is for both you and Justin. The um, So a spacecraft like wind went through the radiation belts a bunch of times, and then now it's sitting out in the solar wind. We, uh, one of the, there's two instruments on wind that, routinely have latch ups that we believe are caused by single event upsets and we just you cycle the power reset them and they're fine um and it and we believe they're single event upsets because it's anti-correlated with the with the solar cycle and so the so it's assuming high energy cosmic rays or something like this and cause little eddy currents in the some electronic part and it's an older old enough mission that the electronic parts are huge compared to the modern ones right like you you build them with breadboards and you can physically grab a a transistor and plug it in kind of thing. They're that big. So, um, but is, is an SEP worse than than uh, uh, than the radiation belts or? Well, let me just comment, but I think Justin is uh, the appropriate person to, uh, to answer the, on the technical level. But of course it depends on the orbit. I mean, uh, satellites that are, the radiation belts are especially problematic for mainly for uh, for MEO uh, or for the MEO orbit, for the navigation orbit, because that's where the maximum flux of uh, the radiation of the electron belt is. Um, of course, we have also the inner belt, which is uh, closer to the Earth and which uh, could be a problem, but practically speaking, again, low earth orbit satellites uh, are below the inner belt so the inner belt does not uh, is not really a big problem for them uh, so 
it's mainly uh, navigation satellites that are affected, can be affected by the radiation belts. Now regarding the impact of these particles, the actual impact, I think Justin is uh, the appropriate person to uh, reply to this. Yeah, it's, it's... Let me go, before you, before you go, Justin, my question was which of them are hardest to assess, not which of them are necessarily worst, right? Uh, please, Justin. It's to 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 Lynn, Lynn's question. Um, I, I, I think it, my opinion they they all matter. Uh, it, it, to me, when when you're looking at single event effect risk in passing through the inner belts, if you've got proton sensitive parts, that then you need to worry. Once you get out of the magnetosphere, you've got your always there cosmic rays that you that you mentioned. Um, that generally speaking, that that flux doesn't change a whole lot i mean yeah it's anti-correlated but but generally speaking it's kind of it's kind of always there the only transient events you, you're going to get are your, your solar particle events and, and again if you if you're proton sensitive or or soft from a heavy ion standpoint that that may be your driver if you've got to quote unquote operate through solar particle events if you're an instrument looking for solar particle events you've got to be able to handle that um if, if you can tolerate like you like you described if you can tolerate shutting it down or, or restarting every every so often every time you get a bad spe then that's not a bad thing thank you all right we are i think out of time let's thank both speakers again thank you thank you uh, all for dialing in and just a quick announcement we're going to take a summer break uh, and restart the series in September. So we'll uh, keep up with the announcements. Uh, we'll announce it in SPA and via our, uh, uh, our email list. So thank you all and have a great summer and uh, talk to you in a couple of months. Thank you, Sasha. Take care. Bye. Bye.